Hey up, it's the old Yorkshire geek here, back again with some more geeky news. And we're live again. I'm doing lives all the time these days, aren't I? And uh, hopefully we'll get some viewers soon. We'll see, won't we? Anyway, right, let's crack on. Uh, a bit of news tonight. We've got some Indiana Jones news and a bit of, you know, Star Wars-y type news. And some other stuff as well. And uh, so we'll crack on. Right, I'll make myself smaller. Are you ready? Here we go. Where am I going? Where am I? Uh, you'll do there. <coughs> Just clear my throat. Hope you can hear me. My microphone says it's microphoning. So hopefully you can hear me. Right, where is it? Bloodush, there we go. Indiana Jones 5 rap photo may reveal film's title. Producer Frank Marshall reveals that filming in on the fifth Indiana Jones film has wrapped and possibly reveals its official title. I've had a sneak peek at this and, you know, I usually just usually just boom the articles there, you know, after a cursory glance, but I couldn't resist. And if it's, this is the title, it's shite. So, <laughs> anyway... So let's carry on. There's a, uh, is that, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Drew thingamabob. Oh, I don't know. Anyway, right. I know it's Indiana Jones. What about the, the artist? Right. Uh, Indiana Jones 5 has wrapped filming and may have an official title. Earlier in the week, producer Frank Marshall teased on Twitter that the upcoming Indiana Jones instalment was in the home stretch of shooting. Now, Marshall has confirmed on the platform that filming is finished, posting a hat, that's a cap, with the protagonist's signature nickname, Indy. Being that the film has yet to receive any title beyond Indiana Jones 5, it is possible that the fifth instalment will be Indy. I hope not, because that is a terrible title. And there's the picture uh, from Frank Marshall's uh, Twitter. Indy, I don't think that's going to be the name of the film. I don't think. If it is, it's the worst title in the history of film titles. It could be about motor racing, couldn't it? <laughs> the rap on Indiana Jones 5 comes over a decade after the film went into production following its predecessor from 2008, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. I don't think it's been in production, active production for 10 years, has it? Don't work like that. Uh, the film ended with Indy, Harrison Ford, finally marrying his love interest, Marion Ravenwood, Karen Allen. After an adventure filled with sword fighting, killer ants and even aliens. And it, it wasn't very good, was it? Despite reviving the franchise after 20 years, the film was not received as a favourite film among fans. There's, there's three Indiana Jones films. The Last Crusade, you know, that, that was a nice end. Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal School was just, you know, a film. <laughs> In, you know, as much as Uncharted is a Tomb Raider game. Uh, anyway, Indiana Jones 5, or the possible indie, will be the next film from the previous decade uh, to see Ford return to one of his most iconic roles. He reprised his role, or is it reprised? I don't know, I said reprised. His role as the beloved scruffy-looking Han Solo for 2015 Star Wars The Force Awakens, and then died. As well as Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker, which well, that could have been a deep fake for all we know. In 2017, he also reprised his role as Rick Deckard for Blade Runner 2049. As for the upcoming movie, there are many rumours and reports suggesting what viewers can anticipate. Uh, set photos that surfaced back in October 2021 showed what seemed to be Roman gladiators with historically, ac historically, historically accurate weaponry, hinting at a possible time travel element to the film. The set photos also gave a look at actor Phoebe Waller-Bridge, who is rumoured to have a major role in the film. I hope the rumours you know, are not true. Uh, previous reports claim that Waller-Bridge will be portraying Indy's assistant in the film, which will open the door for her to take control of the franchise. This way, when Ford is finished with his signature whip and fedora, Waller-Bridge can pick them up to continue the story of archaeology and adventure. Um, as for this upcoming adventure, aside from potential time travel, actor Mads Mikkelsen will reportedly play the antagonist of the film as a Nazi scientist. So I think it's to do with the uh, 
the De Glocke, which is the, the Nazi bell, which was an experiment that they did in somewhere in Poland, um, um, which they don't know what it was, basically. They, it, it were a weird bell-shaped thing, and they don't, did it go to another dimension? Did it travel through time? Was it an alien spaceship? Nobody knows. Or was it all made up? I don't know. But that's what I think it is, that is all about. Anyway, the wrap on filming also comes after significant delays before the most recent date change. The film was set to hit theatres on July 29th this summer, but was delayed for another year, uh, another year this past October. Indiana Jones 5 is currently scheduled, scheduled, whatever, to release on June 30th, uh, 2023. I nearly said 3023 then. Uh, 2023, so... I suspect there's good, there's big reshoots and changes because there were rumours knocking about that um, you know spoilers if this is what's going to happen that Indy dies in this film not only dies but is erased from existence due to the time travel shenanigans and it turns out that Indy is going to be uh, the Phoebe Waller-Bridge character she's going to be India you know Indiana Jones moving forward. And not only, you know, a new Indiana Jones, she will have been the only Indiana Jones because the you know, the one we know will have been erased from history. Uh, and I bet the thought, you know, the backlash from fans when that that um that rumour surfaced, I bet they're changing stuff. They've put it back and I bet they're changing stuff, they're doing reshoots and all that jazz. But anyway, we shall see. They've got another what is it, year? What is it? June 30th, 2023. A year and a bit. Anyway, that's the cap. Indy. Rubbish title, isn't it? It's rubbish. It's rubbish if that's going to be the title. It won't be. It won't. They can't call it that. They can't. But you never know these days. Anyway, so, so there you go. Anyway, so we'll move on to the next story. Get rid of that. Which is the Mandalorian director? You can't see it. I won't move it. I can't be bothered. The Mandalorian director reportedly has insane new contract uh, with Lucasfilm. Uh, Lucasfilm kicked off its venture into long-form storytelling on Disney Plus just over two years ago with The Mandalorian. Under the leadership of Marvel Studios icon John Favreau, Din Djarin's intergalactic adventure became an instant success as the streamer's flagship series at launch. Uh, oh yeah, as the yeah sorry, as the streamer's flagship series at launch, racking up impressive viewership numbers while earning critical success and awards recognition as well. I still can't read, can I? Oh, we're on episode twenty-eight, and I'm still useless. Never mind. That's why I have no viewers. <laughs> I don't care, I'm not bothered. Favreau turned himself into an entertainment industry icon when he teamed up with Lucasfilm on The Mandalorian, finding himself with the chance to expand Star Wars' lore beyond the big screen. The actor-director did the same thing with Star Wars that he did with the Marvel Cinematic Universe when he directed Iron Man and Iron Man 2. And he has, uh, and he now has credits on arguably the two biggest pop culture franchises running. Moving past writing work on nearly every chapter of The Mandalorian, Favreau also played the writer-creator role on all seven chapters of the Book of Boba Fett. And it appears to be far from done, uh, and appears to be far from done with this universe. Uh, that's now confirmed to be the case thanks to a new report teasing Favreau's extended future with the company behind the galaxy far, far away. Mandalorian director sticking with Lucasfilm. And there he is with kind of mad hair. <laughs> a new report from Puck News, uh, News's Matthew Baloney. I've heard that name before somewhere. I can't remember where from. Anyway, as discovered by Twitter user uh, XK Bishop X. Uh, shared new information on the Mandalorian creator John Favreau's contractual ties with Lucasfilm and Disney. Initially, Favreau and Lucasfilm reportedly only agreed to just one season of the original Disney Plus Star Wars show. Following season one's successful shoot, the two parties signed an insane deal for Favreau to continue developing projects for the galaxy far, far away. They like saying that, don't they? Agreeing 
agreeing to his current contract, which includes a plethora of bonuses and incentives. Sorry, I thought I heard somebody knocking, but the month. Uh, which includes a plethora of bonuses and incentives for writing and directing individual Star Wars episodes. Despite the lucrative deal, Baloney believes that it's unlikely that Favreau is receiving royalty payments for the Mandalorian merchandise sales. How long will Favreau and Star Wars stay together? This report makes it clear that Jon Favreau won't be leaving the Star Wars story any time soon. Although the Iron Man director initially only took on duties for the first eight chapters of The Mandalorian, um, he's played a role in nearly every Disney Plus entry to come since that time. He's already attached uh, as an executive producer for Rosario Dawson's uh, Ahsoka series. And while it's unclear how many entries he will direct and write, uh, that shouldn't be the last time fans see him in this universe. Having also provided his acting talents to the role of Paz Vizsla in one chapter, of each of both of his first two shows, Favreau's influence can't be understated. This new contact only nails down how much influence he will continue to have on Lucasfilm's continuing expansion into episodic stories on Disney+. Plus. While the details of his new contract may not come to light for some time, fans can expect to see Favreau's name in the credits of future Star Wars entries for a long time. All 16 chapters of The Mandalorian and all 7 chapters of The Book of Boba Fett are now streaming on Disney+. Plus. So there you go. So it looks like he's, uh, he's going to be doing more Star Wars for Disney+. Plus, Which is okay by me, I don't hate. Uh, you know, I like The Mandalorian, I didn't hate Book of Boba Fett. It wasn't, it wasn't amazingly good, but you know. It was adequate, it was adequate. And uh, obviously Dave Falone has got to... He'll, I think he'll be doing more... To, he'll have more to do with the Ahsoka, won't he? Dave Falone. So, rather than John Favreau. I can see a, I can see a whisker. One of my moustache whiskers. I can see it sticking up and it's catching, catching light from me. From me like there. Getting on my nerves. <laughs> have a little sip. Mercury Rapids. Available, Amazon, not the cup, the book. <sighs> right, uh, yes, we'll leave it there. I had another Star I'm going to do another Star Wars story that I came across. Um, it was to do with Daisy Ridley um, being, you know, dumped, in quotes, um, for uh, the new... There's been rumours that there's going to be a new Star Wars series of films set after the, the sequel trilogy... And when this story emerged, that uh, Daisy Ridley were going to be playing, not playing, uh, Daisy Ridley's character Ray were going to be played by somebody else, somebody that's been in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I don't know who, I didn't read that far. Uh, I just read as far as the source, which was Mike Zero, and I thought, well, uh, fair enough, I won't bother reading anymore. <laughs> because Mike Zero isn't, uh, you know, He's not exactly a reliable source, is he? Anyway, so there we go. So next up, a bit of Lord of the Rings. Can you see that? Yeah, you can. Tolkien Estate releases previously unseen Lord of the Rings material. J.R.R. Tolkien's Estate. I said, what did I say something? I said, I tried to say what it stood for J.R.R. And I, I was saying stupid things like John James and all that. Well, no, I'm stupid. It's, it's, is it John Ronald Rule or something like that? Anyway, is it, it is John, isn't it? Correct me in the comments or in the chat if anybody, you know, nobody's there like, but never mind. <laughs> Correct me in the comments. Anyway, J.R. Tolkien's estate releases unseen material from the Lord of the Rings trilogy and the Hobbit, including paintings, maps and audio recordings. And there's a picture. Is this one of them? I don't know. But that's the barrel tripping it from um, the Hobbit, which we saw on film, which was, you know, bit silly wasn't it we're all right but you know a bit over the top anyway a wealth of unseen the lord of the rings material has been released from author J.R. tolkien's estate as reported by the guardian the new material includes photographs paintings uh, depicting various locations in middle earth as well as tolkien's letters and draft manuscripts from the hobbit and the lord of the rings trilogy the tolkien estate's official website has been updated with the new material and there's a link there if you want to go visit it. As usual, the links for all the stuff I'll be reading are in the description below. And don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell 
if you want to see you know be notified of future stuff i do and drop a comment as i said you know correcting me for my mistakes which will be myriad and um what else i think that's about it, isn't it? yeah and just be nice to each other and me <laughs> uh right uh where was also among the new material are multiple audio recordings and videos featuring both Tolkien and his son Christopher. By the way, I'm, I'm drinking coffee today. I'm not having booze, I'm not having Red Bull. I threw, half of, I threw it away that I had yesterday. It was horrible. So hopefully I won't be burping. So I'm having coffee because I was yawning earlier on. I'm, I'm a bit uh, tired today for some reason. I think it's the weather. Do nothing but rain all day here. Anyway, uh, da, 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 da. also among the new material uh, are multiple audio recordings and videos featuring both Tolkien and his son Christopher, who passed away in 1973 and 2020, respectively. Among the audio recordings is the first recording of Gollum, as he was imagined by the author, when he first meets Bilbo Baggins in The Hobbit. The Tolkien estate relaunched its website with this unseen material on February 26th, a significant day in Tolkien lore. I wonder if it sounds like um, um, Andy Serkis, I suppose. Well, I'll have to follow the link. I haven't followed the link, so I don't know. I haven't listened to it. And I won't do it now, because, uh, because I'll, I'll get lost. I will. I'll, um. <laughs> the link's there if you want to follow it. There. There we go. There it is. In red there. Can you see it? Do 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 where that with the Tolkien estate relaunched its website with this unseen material on February twenty sixth, a significant day in Tolkien law, as February twenty sixth, thirty nineteen. Oh yeah, is the date that the Fellowship of the Ring was broken, leaving Sam and Frodo thirty nineteen of the of the Third Age, leaving Sam and Frodo to set out on their journey towards Mordor. For Tolkien, uh, his creative processing uh, process included writing, painting, creating maps and inventing languages, which he did for The Hobbit, The Silmarillion and The Lord of the Rings trilogy, which was originally published between 1954 and 1955. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings was adapted into the acclaimed film trilogy by, directed by Peter Jackson. The most recent adaptation will be a prime video series, Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, which will take place during the second age of Middle-earth, thousands of years before the events of The Hobbit. I hope it's good, but it's not looking good, but I hope it is. We talked with the Tolkien Estate co-showrunner J.D. Payne, said of the series, which is intended to be a 50-hour, five-season series. If you are true to the exact letter of the law, you are going to be telling a story in which your human characters are dying off every season because you are jumping 200 years in time, and then you are not, re then, and then you are not meeting really big, important canon characters until season four. Oops. So what? That's the story. That's the story. Tell it like that. If you've got to have new characters, new human characters every season, so be it. Be, give new actors jobs, won't it? The, the, the viewing public, they can keep up if you tell it well. Don't treat them like idiots. Look, there might be some fans who want us to do a documentary of Middle-earth. It don't have to be a documentary. Just make a, a good story and tell it well. As uh, Tolkien, think to yourself, say, would Tolkien like this? And if you think you would, you're doing it right. But we're go anyway. But we're going to tell one story that unites all these things. I mean, Tolkien probably wouldn't, wouldn't have even liked uh, Peter Jackson's you know, films, but um, you know, he did his best, did Peter Jackson, to, to you know cram everything from the three books into his you know his epic films, and he did pretty much a good job. Obviously, some people didn't like it, but 99.9% .9 of people did. Anyway. And it seems to be the other way around with this uh, Rings of Power. It's getting uh, it's getting ratioed on YouTube, you know, the trailers and the little special videos they're doing. Getting what's called being ratioed, you know, where the, the dislikes outnumber the likes. <sighs> but they're blaming it on, you know, negative fans doing organised campaigns. And they're not, they're not. Just, just the fans making their feelings known. 
Anyway, Prime Video sweeping big budget fantasy series began filming in February 2020 but paused for several months before resuming in September that same year. Amazon made an official announcement for season 2 after committing $250 million for the franchise's television rights, reportedly aiming for a five season run. Season 1 wrapped filming in early August and it was later announced that the series would be moving from New Zealand to the UK for filming on season 2. Come here, come here, you. Yeah, 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 you go in. Uh, developed by JD Payne and Peter McKay. Was it McKay? Don't know. The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, will premiere on Prime Video from September 2nd, 2022. And that's it. So there you go. So if you want to see the uh, material, it's. Oh, where, where is it? Here. It's at the Tolkien Estates official website. I shall open the link in a new tab. Let's have a look at There we go. That's what it looks like. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, uh, there we go. It's, you know, it's classy, I suppose you could say. It's a picture of the man himself there. Still round the corner there may wait a new road or a secret gate, the Fellowship of the Ring. Uh, audio, visual, audio. Let's have a look here. Yeah. Let's see if we can find this... Uh, this um, thingy. Do, 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 do. This is the first recording of Gollum as imagined by his creator. Right, will this play then? Let's have a go, eh? Deep down here over the dark water lived old Gollum. I don't know where he came from, nor who or what he was. He was Gollum, as dark as darkness, except for two big, round, pale eyes. He had a boat, and he rode about quite quietly on the lake, for lake it was, wide and deep and deadly cold. He paddled it with large feet dangling over the side, but never a ripple did he make, not he. He was looking out of his pale lamp-like eyes for blind fish, which he grabbed with his long fingers as quick as thinking. He liked meat too, goblin he thought good, when he could get it. But he took care they never found him out. He just throttled them from behind if ever they came down alone anywhere near the edge of the water while he was prowling about. They very seldom did, for they had a feeling that something unpleasant was lurking down there, down at the very roots of the mountain. They had come on the lake when they were tunneling down long ago, and they found they could, not, they could go no further. So there their road ended in that direction, and there was no reason to go that way unless the great goblin sent them. Sometimes he took a fancy for fish from the lake, and sometimes neither goblin nor fish came back. Actually, Gollum lived on a slimy island of rock in the middle of the lake. He was watching Bilbo now from the distance with his pale eyes like telescopes. Bilbo could not see him, but he was wondering a lot about Bilbo, for he could see that he was no goblin at all. Gollum got into his boat and shot off from the island while Bilbo was sitting on the brink, altogether flummoxed and at the end of his way in his wits. Suddenly up came Gollum and whispered and hissed, Bless us and splash us, my precious. I guess it's a choice feast. At least the tasty morsel it'll make us Gollum. And when he said Gollum, he made a horrible swallowing noise in his throat. That is how he... Very good, there you go, so that's how uh, um, Tolkien imagined Gollum sounded. And it did sound a bit like um, you know, Andy Serkis, so Andy Serkis got it right, didn't he? Pretty much. So I think I think Tolkien would have been happy with Gollum in uh, Lord of the Rings. I do. Right, so there you go, so you can follow that, uh, that link. Ooh. Right, so that's, uh, was that it? Have I finished? Have I finished? Yes, I have, right. Yes, I finished that one. Right, so next up, well, oh yes, a bit of, uh, no, it's not sad news because it's seven years, but um, Leonard Nimoy's family and William Shatner pay tribute to Star Trek legend seven years after his death. Obviously, yesterday was the seventh anniversary of Leonard Nimoy's passing. Leonard Nimoy's children and his Star Trek co-star, William Shatner, are remembering the late actor on the seventh anniversary of his death. Uh, Nimoy played the iconic role of Spock in Star Trek the original series and the six films featuring the show's cast 
opposite Shatner as Captain James T. Kirk. He also appeared in 2009 Star Trek and 2013 Star Trek Into Darkness. Uh, in 2015, Nimo, uh, Nimo, Nimoy uh, died aged, uh, at age 83 due to complications of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Nimoy's Spock left an indelible mark on popular culture and remains as iconic and beloved as a character as ever. Mm. Oh, bad me, I said I wouldn't be burping, didn't I? I just did. Oh, I tell you, don't matter what I do. Uh, remembering my dad uh, at the real Nimoy, uh, on the seventh year of his passing, Nimoy's daughter Julie tweeted, Dad, you are hugely missed, especially your warm and loving hugs. Your memory lives on, always and forever. There's the there's the tweet with a photo of uh, Leonard Nimoy, and I presume that's Julie. His daughter. And then from Adam Nimoy, uh, though Dad left us seven years ago today, he's still very much in our minds. May we embrace his memory and Mr. Spock's message of logic and peace, love to all, Adam. Uh, who uh, I think Adam Nimoy directed at least one episode of The Next Generation. There might have been more. There might have been more, but I do remember he directed at least one episode of The Next Generation. And I do believe he's married to Terry Farrell, who plays... Um, um, Jadzia Dax in Deep Space Nine. I think I think they got married. I'm sure they did. Uh, have I just read that? Yeah, yes, I've just read that. Haven't I? Oh, crikey. Yeah. Adam and Julie Nimoy each directed separate films about their father's life. Adam directed For the Love of Spock before Nimoy's death. The film puts a significant focus on the impact of Leonard Nimoy's role as Spock. Uh, Julie Nimoy and her husband David Knight co-directed the 27 documentary Remembering Leonard Nimoy, which focused more on Nimoy himself and his life with COPD. Uh, that's that chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Oh, disorder. I think it's disease, isn't it? Uh, Shatner shared many scenes with Nimoy. Uh, he tweeted a photo of the two of them embracing out of character and simply Leonard, 3.26.31 to 2.27.15. Uh, and they did make, obviously, the, they went many years, you know, where they, they didn't talk to each other, they fell out, didn't they, and that. And towards towards the, the end, they, uh, they kind of met up, didn't they, thankfully. Thankfully. Uh, the official Star Trek Twitter account also tweeted out a story from the official Star Trek website celebrating Nimoy's life. The story is full of photos from Nimoy's time working on Star Trek. Remembering one of Star Trek's greatest icons, live long and prosperous, uh, hashtag Star Trek family, the tweet reads. Last year, Nimoy's hometown of Boston declared March 26th, Nimoy's birthday, to be Leonard Nimoy Day. At the time, Mayor uh, Marty Walsh wrote in his declaration, I encourage all Bostonian to recognise Leonard Nimoy's commitment and dedication to the arts and the lasting impact that he has left on the community. The city also announced plans to build a 20-foot statue of Spock's iconic Vulcan salute in Nimoy's honour. The live long and prosper symbol represents a message that my dad believed so strongly in, Julie Nimoy said in a statement at the time. My dad always loved Boston and he would be honoured knowing that the Museum of Science would be the permanent home to this memorial. The sculpture not only depicts one of the world's most recognised and loved gestures for peace, tolerance and diversity, but it will also be a beautiful uh, tribute to my dad's life and legacy. And there we go. That's, uh, and that's that. There we go. That's, uh, that's the Vulcan salute, which they're talking about. Which is from a Jewish, um, a Jewish um, ritual, not ritual, um, you know, practice. Um, I forgot what it, what it, it's a letter in it, the Jewish uh, the Hebrew alphabet but I can't remember what so there you go there you go you know he was a legend and it's seven years since he passed away and the pain tribute and it's nice that Ian William Shatner made up before before he passed away right next up oh next will be a Star Wars right this is from uh, Doomcock's uh, pop culture breakdown which I watched this morning Um. Um, you know, visit Doomcock's uh, YouTube channel, subscribe, is you know, is a lot of fun, is a lot of fun. Anyway, this, this section here that we're going to, we're going to show is from, um, uh, uh, it's got, um, um, one of his, uh, one of his, 
one of his slaves, I suppose, at the centre of the earth. It's called Kelvington, and he's very funny. He's got a dry sense of humour. Anyway, he did this little video about um, Max Rebo there, telling about how they're make, making a mess of uh, what he looks like, basically. They've, they've not realised what he looks, what, is, what it was designed to look like by Phil Tippett and the, you know, the Lucasfilm Creature Shop. Or industrial light and magic creature shop um originally for return of the jedi and they're getting it wrong so anyway i've just pressed play i'll have to mute my microphone so it doesn't um and then we have the volumes on full so i'll mute my microphone and i'll just press play and we should be you know rocking and rolling and that's max rebo by the way <laughs> before i start I can't remember. Maybe there might be a bit of swearing in this. I don't know. I can't. I can't remember offhand if if there is, but there might be. As I said, uh, Kelvington's got you know a dry sense of humour, and he sometimes you know lets a bit of you know, bad language in. But you know what the heck. But uh, right, we'll try again. Except mm. there's a problem. He does not look like that. Max Rebo is got no legs. He plays his musical instrument with his feet, even though Kenner made a toy, like here he is playing, but he's really playing with his feet. But when you see the toy, it looks like he's in a diaper and he's got legs. He doesn't. This is Phil Tippett working on the puppet, and you can yep. clearly see that he has just got legs, no bottom. And if people like argue that more and they go like, no, this is the fucking maquette that uh, Philip Tippett made. There are no arms on this character. This really bugs me. And people go, well, like, look at him here. He's sitting, you know, on, in a pod. No, he's sitting on a pillow, not a pod. So that's really that really bugged me a lot that even people that work closely with lucasfilm can't get a simple detail right like max rebo has no legs so that that bugs me an awful lot and the last thing that's bugging me this week you know we we talked about the star trek movie and and then he goes on about star trek if they were talking about things that bug them you know that, that annoy them and uh, that was uh, what annoyed Kelvington, that uh, people think that um, people don't realise that Max Rebo is playing the keyboard with his feet. You know, he's got his, his legs are like coming up. A bit like, um, you know, like Sabulba in Phantom Menace. He did all his, you know, hand, his hands were basically his feet, weren't his, his, his legs came up and his hands, his, his, his arms and his hands were his walking bits, weren't they? And his legs and his feet were his hands. If you, if you know what I mean. Anyway, uh, but um, Max Rebo, a bit like that, except he ain't got hands. He's just got two legs, and he sits on the cushion, and plays his keyboards, obviously, with his feet. And I didn't know that. I didn't know that. But now I do. So there you go. And now, so do you. Max Rebo plays the keyboards with his feet, and he's got no hands. So uh, when... Um, Robot Chicken showed him getting out the uh, the wreckage of the sail barge and uh, walking about. That's wrong. You know, because they were saying, I've got to get to the gig, didn't they? And they went and ended up going to Moss Island. Anyway. <laughs> so Moss, uh, Max Rebo has no hands. He plays the keyboards with his feet. Right. Another thing here. This is from two years ago. Sorry about that. But this caught my eye. I think it was actually Doug Drexler on his Facebook page posted it, and it, it made me smile. An anti-smartphone with a rotary designed and built... Uh, his rotary dial. Designed and built by space engineer Justine Hopt... Hopt is that how you pronounce it? I don't know. But there it is. Look at that. That's amazing, isn't it? And I want one, but I bet they're expensive. Look, kids today have no idea what we had to go through to phone people in the olden days now you can do it anywhere look justine hopped a developer of astronomy uh, instrumentation at brookhaven national laboratory spent the last three years developing a device that strips away all of the non-phone functions of modern smartphones the portable wireless electronic digital rotary telephone aka rotary cell phone 
does not have a touch screen, menus or other superfluous features. It fits in Hop's pocket and it makes calls. The first version of Hop's uh, anti-smartphone was made using a cell phone radio development board. As the pro uh, project progressed, she worked out a way to make it compact. Oh, bad me. To view missed calls, I said, I've got coffee, and so I won't be burping, and I'm, I'm still burping. It must be nerves. Anyway, um, <laughs> to view missed calls on a small display, and to ensure the device could be taken apart and fixed if necessary. While the rotary cell phone may seem like a fun novelty, Hopped un up until now a devoted flip phone user, says that is not the point. Everything from the removable antenna to dedicated speed dial keys for her husband and other contacts is utilitarian and a direct contrast to the devices many of you are reading this article on now. I'm not, I'm reading it on my, com my computer. This is a statement against a world of touchscreens, hyperconnectivity and complacency with Big Brother watchdogs, Hopped writes on her website. In a post sharing the open source design, she adds that uh, in a finicky, annoying touchscreen world of hyperconnected people using phones they have no control over or understanding of, I wanted something that would be entirely mine, personal and absolutely tactile, while also giving me an excuse for not texting. <laughs> and there's another picture of it. It's, oh, I love it. I bet it's not available. I bet, it, like I said, she's just made it for herself. I know they're tickling, which means I'm going to have an argument. She just made it for herself and her husband. Probably. But yeah, it's cool. And it's got a thing there for, I don't know, something to plug in. There we go, wireless electronic digital portable telephone. Viewing from all sides. Oh, that's it. All right, there you go. So, yeah, obviously it's not available commercially. It doesn't look like. She just made it for herself. But I thought it was cool. And I want one. You know what? I should get, for, for the landline, we should, I should, everybody should have a rotary phone. You can get them, can't you, these days? I've seen them. I've seen them, but I've not splashed out for one because they're not cheap, really. Anyway, last up. Last up, a bit of science news. Tonga volcano eruption yields insights into asteroid impacts on Earth. And there's the satellite image of the Tongan volcano, the Hunga Tonga Hunga. Hap high. Ha up high. Volcano eruption is seen from space in this NASA animation. Look at it. Anyway. Uh, din, 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 din. On January 15th, 2022, the Hunga Tonga Hunga ha, ha, <laughs> volcano. I'm sorry, I'm not laughing at you know foreign words. I'm I'm just laughing at myself trying to pronounce them. Volcano erupted off the coast of Tonga in the South Pacific Ocean, generating a tsunami and triggering and triggering resulting wave action alerts around the world. The underwater volcano eruption spewed ash, steam and gas over a, ra a radius of over 160 miles, 260 kilometres, and more than 12 miles, 19 kilometres, into Earth's atmosphere. An infrasound network operated by the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organisation, CTBTO, found the blast to be the largest incident ever recorded by that monitoring system. All 53 infrasound stations recorded the main eruption at global ranges. The discharge was much larger than the Chelyabinsk meteor airburst in 2013. The Tongan government described the eruption as an unprecedented disaster with the island nation suffering loss of life, major damage to homes and loss of infrastructure. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I wonder how many... The loss of life, did that mean you know, people died or on the back? Animal, you know, animals. I don't know because I've not seen any, you know, about how many people died. Anyway, it's very sad if that's happened. Anyway, uh, da -da -da. we now know quite a bit about the undersea upsurge, and there appear to be takeaway messages for those concerned about an impact in space rock and the creation of similar effects. Space.com reached out. Uh, to noted experts in the asteroid field, uh, asteroid impact field, to gauge similarities between an undersea belch and Earth taking an asteroid punch in the oceans. Indeed, data amassed from the Tonga occasion is keeping the scientific community busy. 
That's an infrasound station operated go away, go away. Uh, operated by the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organisation. All 53 infrasound stations record the main eruption at global ranges, and that's it. So basically, is it basically microphones stuck in the earth that um, can detect seismic events? Lindley Johnson is NASA's planetary defense officer in Washington. We should examine all natural disasters, but both volcanoes and earthquakes in particular, for lessons to be learned about the effects and after effects of a significant asteroid impact. Johnson, you know, fully the saying that this week, in it, when we get in the, you know, a sort of near miss of um, this, what, this, um, this, this, is it 1.2 kilometer asteroid that's going to go past on this week, or whenever it is. Is it five million kilometres away? So it's not not exactly close. Anyway, anyway, Johnson pointed out there have been suggestions that the Tonga eruption released about the same amount of energy as is estimated from the June thirtieth, nineteen o eight Tunguska impact event in Siberia, Russia. I don't know how uh, I don't know how valid that assessment is, but it, it is certainly worth looking at as an analogy. And it, ooh, a dangerous asteroid is likely to hit an ocean, not land, because over 70% of Earth's surface is ocean, but a disproportionately large fraction of people live near coasts, so tsunamis are a threat. Clark Chapman, a senior scientist retired from the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado, told Space.com. We need to learn more about asteroid impact tsunamis because they probably behave very differently from those caused by earthquakes or landslides, Chapman said. De -de 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 risk assessments and simulations. Lorian Wheeler and colleague Michael Aftosmith uh, work on NASA's Asteroid Threat Assessment Project at the Ames Research Center in California's Silicon Valley. Their research is done under NASA's, na NASA's, NASA's, <laughs> NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office. Wheeler is the risk assessment lead for the project, focusing on building fast running, prob prob oh God, probabilistic models that look at the amount of risk that different ast <laughs> asteroid hazards can pose. <sighs> I'm struggling out today. Can't say asteroid hazards. I'm sorry. Asteroid hazards. Uh, Aftosmith is an aerospace engineer ooh, cracky, in the Advanced Supercomputing Division developing high-fidelity simulations of asteroid strikes, including blast wave propagation, tsunami, thermal and global effects. The analogy between a volcano and an asteroid hit is not obvious, uh, Aftosmith said, as one comes from the ground up and the other comes from the outside in. An undersea volcano and an asteroid impact uh, they have a lot of similarities when it comes to the kind of tsunami that might be triggered, he said. Coupling of energy. And there's a photo of the uh, volcano doing its stuff. Uh, when, you look at the, oh God, when you look at the aggregate level of risk uh, from potential asteroid impacts, considering all the different frequencies of sizes that are most likely to hit us, Wheeler said, our current models indicate the risk of large tsunamis from asteroid impact impact is relatively low compared to other potential impact hazards like globe, uh, local blast and global effects. However, given a big enough asteroid that strikes close enough to a coastline, it could cause a sizable tsunami, Wheeler said. It's important to develop good tsunami models to be able to predict those consequences as well as we can. The Tonga incident may give, may give some insights on the coupling of energy to the atmosphere and water, such as how fast ocean waves dissipate, to better refine simulation models, Wheeler said. Air blast coupling, the tsunami from the eruption itself, and also seismic effects, uh, seismic effects data from the Tonga episode are being studied. While asteroid-generated tsunamis are a relatively small threat contrasted to other effects, this particular case does have some interesting similarities and raises physics questions worthy of pursuit, Aftosmith said. Furthermore, over several years there have been a series of tabletop exercises hosted jointly by NASA and the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, held specifically to respond to and better prepare for an asteroid meets Earth scenario if and when emergency action is required. 
The upshot from assessing the Tonga event does yield valuable information that could be fed into future tabletop exercises to better hone ways to estimate the level of risk and better inform response decisions, Wheeler said. Existence proof. Noted asteroid expert Mark Bosloff, or Boslo, I don't know, I'd say Bosloff, I don't know. I apologise to Mr. Mark <laughs> if I've butchered his name. But it's not, it's not a rare event. Anyway, he's an adjunct uh, professor in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at the University of New Mexico. He participated in documentary field expeditions to airburst sites, including the Libyan desert of Egypt in 2006, Tunguska in 2008. Why am I saying it like that all of a sudden? I usually said 2006, 2008. Weird. And Chel uh, Chelyabinsk, Russia in 2013. To assess the impressive February 15, 2013 event when a destructive meteor burst occurred in the atmosphere. There's lots of videos of that on YouTube showing what happened. Not just the, you know, the showing it from a distance and it, you know, the, the meteor like blew up in the atmosphere, but the, the effects on the ground, the wind has been smashed and everything. It's quite scary if you were in the middle of it. Uh, several years ago, um, Several years ago, Boslo, Bosloff, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it, suggested the potential for asteroid airburst generated meteor tsunami, large waves driven by air pressure disturbances. As for the Hunga Tonga Hunga Ha A Pai <laughs> volcano, sorry, I can't help it, eruption. Uh, yes, this is a great test of the idea, and I understand that meteor tsunami were detected in Puerto Rico and Menorca, Boslo said. It appears that Boslo, to Boslo, it appears to Boslo, Boslo, oh God, I'm making a night mess of this. It could be Boslock for all I know, I don't know, because that's, that is spell lock, isn't it, in Ireland. <sighs> anyway, it appears to this chap that these have to be from air coupled tsunamis as opposed to direct generation at the source of the explosion because they are in different ocean basins. If this turns out to be the case, then we now have an existence proof that pressure waves in the atmosphere from big explosions can trigger tsunami far away from the explosion itself. If volcanoes can do this, I think asteroid airbursts can as well, Boslo said. And there it says who wrote it, which is very interesting, Lennon David, there we go. It's the author of Moon Rush, the new space race. So there we go. So the data from a volcano can show us what could happen. If an asteroid hits us, but uh, if an asteroid hits us, it hits us. Not we can do about it. <laughs> but I suppose they can prepare, can't they? If the no one's coming and where it's going to hit, they can work that out, can't they? Quite accurately. They can um, prepare and evacuate people, I suppose, from coast coastal areas that might get a tsunami. So there we go. So that's it. Right. So we'll get rid of that. We don't. It's not as long tonight, is it? I'll make myself bigger again. Here's I can see me. Yeah. What do you want to see me for? Uh, I'm hideous. <laughs> there we go. Sorry, I'm looking at my screen over here. Right, so that's it. We're all done. Until tomorrow, when I'm sure I'll find some more news. Um, I don't know what else to say. I've done. I've done what I've set out to do. Which is read you some interest. Well, I, I found them interesting, particularly the Max Rebo stuff. That was interesting. I can't get over that. Being a Star Wars fan all my life, well, since I was 10, and uh, I never knew that Max Rebo played the keyboards with his feet. Hey, as they say, as I say in Yorkshire, I'll go to the foot of our stairs. You learn something new every day get rid of that now right anyway so right i'll leave it there oh cracky it's time to get some chicken for me and that lad upstairs my son because he's hungry and so am i so i think we're gonna order from uh, a chicken a chicken takeaway place that is is decided he likes anyway that's enough of my um you know my life <laughs> um so until tomorrow hopefully um, don't forget to like and subscribe and share the videos and hit the notification bell and drop a comment in the comments 
and uh, be nice and and let everybody know let's try and get some more subscribers and a few more views and be nice as well i know i'm rubbish but i do me best i do me best anyway so until then uh have a great day or rest of your evening or a morning or wherever you are in the world just have a lovely time and look after each other and i'll see thee